Hey guys, welcome back to another episode with me. I'm so excited to present to you Stella and Sonnenbaum. And Stella is not just a sexual therapist. She's a somatic sexologist based out in London. And she helps individuals and couples overcome sexual issues to find greater pleasure in life. So she sees people with a wide range of matters, including trying to overcome sexual fears, exploring new sexual territories, women who have never experienced orgasm, men with performance issues, and couples who want to get independent expert help in getting them more comfortable in communicating with each other about sex. Originally from Germany, she used to be a licensed pharmacist in Berlin, holds a master's in public health, trained in Reiki, Shiatsu, and Tantra, is a certified movement analyst, and taught business for many years. Stella has over 25 years of experience and draws on all of her skills, including decades of self-development, to make them available for you as needed. She loves helping others feel safe in exploring and accepting their sexuality and live a more pleasure-filled life. So without further ado... I'm so excited. Here's Stella. Stella, I'm so, so, so excited to jump on this conversation with you. There's, I'm so drawn to your work. I'm so intrigued and at the same time curious to learn more and at the same time so curious about your work your fascinating woman like your journey to getting to where you are yeah from starting from I think you were in farm as a pharmacist correct and right. and and now you're doing this incredible work with people and so I'm so excited thank you so much for joining me ah it's gonna be awesome so thank you so much for having me Yvonne and for your interest and for your kind words Yes, of course. I think you're such a leader in this in this work, so I'm so excited. So in a recent video, I heard you say in a Unilad video that um, our sexuality is a make or break issue in people's lives. So I'd love to know what you mean by this. Thank you for asking that. So first of all, uh, let me say this is a generalization because I think there are genuinely people for whose sexuality is not important at all mm -hmm. uh, and so I can't speak for those but I think for most people most of us sexuality is much more important than we admit to ourselves mm. and I'm speaking for those people um, the reason being is that I used to be in a so I always had like a quite a high libido, I think, and I was in a sexless relationship uh, with somebody for who partner sex wasn't important. So quite mm. a sexual person, but not partner sex. And because I had never come across a man who didn't like partner sex, I thought, surely we can fix that. Mm. And years went by and me having quite a strong libido, it felt as if uh, I had to kind of like pack my sexuality and libido uh, into a box and put it into the spare room or something like that. Mm. And this is exactly what I hear from uh, people who are in a um, sexless uh, marriage or relationship where uh, or where sex drives differ vastly. Mm. Mm. Uh, and even though for me it was a happy relationship, it was a loving relationship, uh, when I look at photos from that time, I see in my facial expression a deep core unhappiness mm. of not being met in my core. And that's why I'm talking about the make or break. Because if uh, even on the superficially we may be happy, but if the core need isn't fulfilled, that's a problem. That's a problem generally for this kind of deep and all-encompassing happiness. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That's a, uh, I think a lot of people can really resonate with that as well. Like differences between partners. I mean, relationships in themselves are quite intricate. So it's our sexuality only really adds to that boiling pot of emotions and experiences. So thank you for sharing that. And actually Stella, one of the, I want to really point out, cause one of the reasons I absolutely love your work is because you're not a traditional sex therapist. You actually, you call yourself, it's a hands-on sex embodiment mindfulness coach, which is incredible, which means you will actually get 
hands-on if permitted and of course if allowed with your clients to help them create these sensual and sexual experiences that will bring them new epiphanies and new experiences so to me when i read that i was like wow this is so intimate um, to be with someone and it's not what you think of a therapist so can you walk us through who would normally come to see you and like why but also why you've chosen to work so closely with the body like actually physically touching it and energy and that mind body connection that somatic connection uh thank you that's a very all-encompassing question yes I <laughs> and, know. Um, so uh, let me just like give you first of all the short answer to that <laughs> the short answer to that is uh, working with a body can cause these so-called body epiphanies mm. where not just like the mind gets it but the body gets it and so that makes uh, the work really effective because if people can experience something in a session and take that home to practice then they already have the experience and they know what it feels like so it makes the work much more effective basically mm. which is different from a psychosexual therapist uh, who may do kind of similar exercises and send people home with with uh, similar homework but people didn't have this body epiphany that mm. said not all of my sessions obviously have touch all of them will have some kind of self touch even if it's platonic uh, but not all of them have uh, me touching the clients or me touching them intimately. I'm a somatic sexologist, so somatic means body. So the body is always involved in some way, but that doesn't mean that I need to touch people in every session. And also, like, it's very much uh, consensual. And mm -hmm. so I ask people for their hard boundaries in every session. So what is the boundary that they do not want to cross under any circumstances and within that framework it's consensual so I will still ask that permission for every step of the way I would encourage them also to speak out when anything doesn't feel right and um, so mm. that they remain in charge it's very much coaching wow that sounds inc like that sounds like I've never even heard of this this is so exciting for me because why would somebody come to a session with you like what are some of the typical reasons people would come whether you know solo or couple mm -hmm. uh, so a good example for reasons to consensually touch people's or clients bodies in sessions is a an issue called vaginismus mm. for women a vaginismus is an involuntary cramping of the vaginal muscles whenever any kind of uh, penetration is attempted that can be uh, not being able to insert a tampon not being able to insert a finger let alone have a smear test at a gynecologist or mm. uh, with a um, sexual health nurse uh, or um, having intercourse or have a penis insert, yeah. inserted in the vagina uh, so commonly, um, people are sent home to work with dilators. Dilators are little plastic tubes uh, of varying widths. Um, uh, however, like when, when, when it, so in the health system, arousal is not welcome mm. for understandable reasons because uh, both nurses and doctors want to be very clear. Uh, that there um, is not kind of sexual abuse happening. Mm. That's why arousal is a no-no. Yeah. Uh, so the NHS doesn't work with arousal. However, for an issue like vaginismus, it's very conducive to work with arousal because arousal makes us women open up. Yes. The vaginas are not mechanical tubes or something like that. Yes. They respond mm. to our arousal. So that's just a little um, illustration of why that might be helpful. Uh, sexological bodywork and somatic sex education are very are a very new modality. So mm -hmm. they are only like a 15 years old or something like that. Wow. And so they go in between. Um, uh, so it's kind of like it's something that the health sector just doesn't offer. And yes. um, so that's exciting. Yes, I really do. It's it's interesting, and that's really why I was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible, and more people need to know about this. Um, because I know you see people from all walks of life with all kinds of issues as a result of their sexuality, even like we would say more of a actual physical 
so to speak, issue, but, um, and sometimes I guess it's psychological, but Stella, you work because it is so fascinating. What got you into this line of work and what, yeah, in the first place, like what drew you here? A lot of people ask me that. So the question is, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, have you always wanted to be a sex therapist? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> um, uh, That's awesome. So. Uh, first of all, I'm German, so it's a very different society um, in Germany. Mm. So I think people are less hung up about sexuality and bodies. So um, we are the ones who do the skinny dipping and yes. <laughs> kind of take our clothes off as soon as we can. Anywhere, whether <laughs> it's, it's so appropriate true. or not. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of openness. And I think even BDSM is like a really big center in Germany and Berlin, at least. So, yeah, very sexually open. Mm hmm. Uh, so my journey started in a way when I found my first book about Tantra and I was intrigued by the some Indian woodcuts or Kama Sutra style that were very sexually explicit. And so I found it in a bookshop and I went like, <laughs> and then I was like, so intrigued that I got the book and I bought it. So it, it, that was a book about tantric couples rituals. And that was mm -hmm. the first explicit material I had ever seen in my life apart from like biology books yeah explaining the facts of life uh yeah. so because i wasn't familiar with the top shelf at news agents where the porn was and <laughs> also like in those at, in those times it was the 80s or 90s um porn wasn't that widely available so it's not something uh, the internet was just like uh, starting up and uh, so this kind of like online offer of porn wasn't really there as yet mm. And so from then on, I tried to convince um, every boyfriend I had to take up these couples rituals with me uh, without success. <laughs> so I didn't want to That's do amazing. it. amazing. <laughs> because I didn't want to be guinea pigs. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> like, no, 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 I don't want any of this. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so then uh, my journey in Tantra started when I was in that uh, sexless relationship that I described earlier. And because I knew about Tantra, I dragged my partner then to a... A tantra couples retreat and for me that started a journey of uh, heart opening very much a spiritual journey and uh, accepting all of myself and my feminine mm. core and also it transformed the relationship quite a bit wow and i guess ever since uh you just chose to devote yourself to this work yes and so my way from tantra then led me to joseph kramer and uh, he's the founder of sexological bodywork training. So I trained with him and then also um, uh, got my certificate in somatic sex education. And so I founded my company, Stella with Love, in 2014. And with these wow. extra qualifications, I now offer what I do offer since 2015. Wow, incredible. Was it hard to leave uh, your old work to, as a pharmacist or were you like, see you later? Mm -hmm. So I've been on quite a journey. So I was a pharmacist yes. in Germany, but I've been abroad for 25 years and also worked in adult education. Wow. And um, so the educational aspect uh, works well with what I do now. Yeah, I was going to say beautiful combination. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's interesting that when we talk about this and it, you brought it up when you looked at the book and you were like, oh my gosh, there was that element of surprise, almost shock and intrigue. Um, it is my personal experience as well that men and women, we tend to have a lot of guilt and shame around expressing our sexual preferences, our desires issues and our fantasies. So why, why do you think this is like, from working with people, what would you say around this? So um, sexuality is very much linked to the subconscious. And often sexuality has a subversive element mm. to it. Not for everybody, <laughs> but for a lot of people it does. So that people find, um, on the one hand, there's the persona that they know that has values mm. and that knows what's right and wrong. And then there's the sexuality, which is very much linked to their life force. Hmm. And that is uh, turn-ons that we don't fully understand with this mind. Wow. And so bringing these 
bringing these two things together. Actually, they are not, you can't bring them together, but kind of living, so so fully acknowledging that these turn-ons are there without acting on them because we know what's right and how mm. to how to how to act towards ourselves and uh, towards others but at the same time recognizing that that's something that's uh, deeply rooted within us um, which has a subversive element so sexuality might women and mothers make leave their husbands and their children and go off with somebody else that means that in, in a lot of societies there are very strict rules and regulations around sexuality in order to kind of protect the family, in order to protect the children uh, from this subversive, mm. sometimes destructive force. Wow. Does that answer your question? That was a bit of a... <laughs> no, and, and you know, it's fascinating because I'd actually never thought of it like that. Um, and that's really, really interesting that you mentioned that sometimes it's the mind versus the inclination, the sexual inclination, and there's like this almost dissonance there or... Mm, beautiful. So I'm actually, because you mentioned something related to this, that as we start to communicate our preferences and our desires, then that could actually lead to a lot of self-acceptance and self-love. So what does a journey into accepting and communicating these preferences like really f open up for us? So we all have, from society conditioning, we all have the shoulds. How, what, what should mm. we be like? Eh? So we should be a good citizen <laughs> and follow the rules, eh? yeah. <laughs> as we know. Eh? <laughs> uh, we, should be, we should be women who have it all. Um, so mm. we should be great That's mothers. We should be really successful in our jobs. And um, we, should, we should have great orgasms. That's mm. also a should. And so all the shoulds, and there's also ourselves, which is our own pace, our own rhythms, mm. connected with everything around us, meaning that uh, days are not the same. Some days we are able to go through our entire to-do list, and other days is completely impossible. So taking that into, into account, and also taking into account uh, who we really are and what our purpose is and uh, in this world wow. even if it clashes with the shoulds that mm. we have learned uh, uh, society conditioning starts very early with uh, the child wanting to explore everything uh, and not making any difference uh, with with the sense of touch really mm. and uh, and then mum coming along and saying you're yeah. having too much fun with that put that down right? for use <laughs> That yeah. is precious that has a price yeah and uh, uh, and then the kind of like reward and punishment in that respect but also like uh, the mother really trying their best to keep the child safe mm. because children don't discriminate so they put themselves into danger wow, uh, yeah. and so then it, then it follows on from there at school we are told that we need to be useful that we need to pass the tests and jump through the hoops mm. when really we want to kind of Take it easy and play and engage with this a little more, even though it's not useful. Mm -hmm. And so all of that we have in us now as adults. And um, so what I teach people is to reconnect to that uh, sense of delight via the senses, mm. uh, which, which often we as adults, we don't indulge in very much at all. Yeah, it is so true. I love what you said there about the fact all the shoulds that get in the way. And I guess... The more we, would you say the more we break free from these shoulds, the, the more we start to accept ourselves and the more we start to really bring out that, what you were talking about, bring, bringing that more sensual side to everyday life? I would think so, so. So that's very well put. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Because it's true. I think we've lost a lot of that sensuality and that pleasure in our everyday life. And, and, um, and so... Could you share some of the common ways, sometimes they're subtle and sometimes they're overt, uh, how sexual guilt, shame, and kind of like these fears can really come up in relationship or for people that they don't necessarily, that are, they're not aware that this is related to sexual shame or that this is related to guilt? Like ways that are common that these emotions come up for people? Would you like me to give you an example there? 
Okay. Yeah, a, an example mm -hmm. or yeah, that would be perfect. Uh -huh. um, so a lot of women uh, have this should of uh, having to have a great sex life and having to have great orgasms. Mm. So when when women start out in their twenties, actually there is an imperative, which is to be sexual and to have a an exciting sex life, what could be deemed exciting by an outside onlooker. So often I come across young women who kind of override their own boundaries, their own innate boundaries, um, because they think, well, it's all right to do, and uh, mm. uh, I should be more courageous, I should override from what my body tells tells me here i should mm. uh when the body says like wait take take it slowly you're not ready for this yet mm. and uh, so in a way that's um the so, so it's almost the opposite of uh, this kind of suppression of sexuality that now there's the imperative of um uh, uh, being mm. sexual of like having great orgasms uh, at the expense of our own pace, of our, our own inner rhythm. Wow, that's actually fascinating that you bring that because I think the pair, the conversation for a really long time, and it still stays very relevant, is that we've suppressed it um, because you know, so we've been socialized out of being the sexual beings that we might have been, or you know, for some of us anyway. And then it's interesting because now you're right. Now we reach a point where. There's more liberation to the point where we actually are extending farther than our boundaries and limits would want to allow. That's really fascinating. And you see this often? It seems quite a frequent phenomenon uh, among young women, yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, the guilt and the shame around sexuality generally comes from the uh, society conditioning and um, also the entire background of our not not just like uh, our own personal history but also the history of our nations mm. um, so the strong repression of sexuality and sexual freedom as i said uh, earlier yeah wow that's really really fascinating because one of the things where i notice it is like i mean if we look at porn like and for so many generations like sex has been male oriented or male focused in terms of how arousal works like even just from how much pressure women might need to feel or do feel rather in getting turned on as quickly and likewise sometimes it's expecting to receive uh, oral so men expecting oral but not giving it and likewise women not being able to receive it because they're not comfortable with their own smells their own looks um, or taste so what or how can women start to kind of reclaim their their own pleasure both and you brought up the other side as well like when it's too much um too far beyond your boundaries so how can we start to really reclaim pleasure for ourselves it's it's via via communication um so via communication about our likes and dislikes however uh, we need to find out what they are. And so what I encourage uh, uh, couples is to uh, have uh, 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 sessions with each other where they communicate about platonic touch, first of all. Mm. And these are receiver-led. And um, so ideally for the receiver to receive maybe for 20 minutes and uh, the giver is only checking in so like this like this so that we can delve into our own pleasure and preferences and also find out things yeah. that we actually like and, and only then taking it into sexual pleasure as well um, about being comfortable with our own bodies um, let me give you an example so if we think we are great, our smells are great, our looks are great, mm. and we are really attractive. If we have if we have that never confirmed by any partner or by the outside world, we would doubt that. Mm. And so it's not something that we can, it's not a kind of a belief that we can hold just for ourselves. Mm. At least one of our boyfriends. <laughs> has to be like, mm, I love this. Exactly, yeah. So in order for us to be really believe that. So. 
Wow, beautiful. Actually, it's and it's true. I guess that goes to picking lovers and partners that can really love us wholesomely and entirely. And it's 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 beautiful. Um, That's a good point. Thank you for raising that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because it's true. I mean, there's there's everything. So talk to us about trusting our desires. So there are the superficial desires. For example, I desire a cup of coffee, mm-hmm. and there are the deep desires. Uh, and also needs, they, they uh, are linked to the needs, the need to belong, um, the desire to be among people, which is like at the moment really strong mm-hmm. because <laughs> it's so restricted. It's, kind yeah. of me. All the confinements <laughs> um, around the world, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, which actually brings out a lot of desires mm. and that's wonderful. So mm-hmm. that people like, especially in this time where so little is possible, uh, people find their desires suddenly and uh, mm. and uh, speak out about them. Um, so that's a, that's a very surprising side effect that I'm just beginning to realize as well. Mm. Um, the deep desires um, uh, they we have um, are uh, li- are linked to who we are, to what we need to express and what we need to be in this world, and so they are linked to our purpose. And um, so the desires that we have. Uh, are a way towards finding out about our purpose. We don't know, I mean, my my philosophy is that we don't know who we are. The, mm. the entire life is a journey towards finding out who we are and what we need to express in this world and taking our desires seriously um, can help with that because they lead the way towards what we need to do in the world. The uh, the uh, most tragic lives are the lives where people have somewhere on the way given up on their purpose. Mm. So they live lives that are not aligned to their purpose or not aligned to their desires. And um, so these are usually lives of struggle because uh, what we are meant to be will always be there and will always push by our desires. Mm. And When we align ourselves to those desires, that's aligning ourselves to our life force. And so we can be at our best, (laughs) having all uh, all of us available for living the life that we need to live. I love that. And it's interesting because it all kind of adds up. Like when we start to realize our desires, both in life and sexually, it's kind of all the same thing. Like there's no need to categorize them. It seems like desires are again, like a path to getting to know who we are. That's, uh, I've never actually seen it like that. That's beautiful. So you mentioned earlier that it's important for us to communicate. You said communication is like the key in a lot of scenarios to getting, to reclaiming our pleasure. And so with that, what are some, and for some people this might feel awkward because I don't think we have been taught to have communications at this level with our partners. Um, So what are some important conversations that couples need to be having around sex, arousal, and pleasure? That makes makes me laugh because like you say, we've never been taught to communicate about Mm -hmm. pleasure. And so we don't live in a pleasure-oriented society, first of all. And when it comes to sexuality, what we are taught at school, if anything, are the kind of like facts of life, of procreation, and how to not cause unwanted pregnancies, and how to not catch STIs. But lovemaking is supposed to come natural. <laughs> and I <so> know. <laughs> people, people say, okay, uh, but, but, but it doesn't work. How, how, how to do that? Mm. How can I have sexual pleasure? And then they feel guilty about it, because it's all supposed to be <laughs> natural. Yeah. It's all supposed and, to go uh, swimmingly, yeah. Exactly, yeah. And so, so it's so so crucial to have these conversations uh, with our partners. And um, to uh, so so, for example, um, uh, the one one conversation is um, to have is um, the kind of like receiver led. Um, active receiving them so one partner checking in uh, like this like this and what you can talk about is um, the quality of the touch Mm. so um, quality as in like um, the direction the pace the pressure and the area yeah and also what kind of touch can we actually give so it helps working with the elements for example 
you can. So um, you can have like a kind of like more earthy touch like that. Mm -hmm. Have a more watery, flowy touch like that. You could have like an air touch, mm. also flowing, yeah, like a very light touch, um, or a fiery touch. Yeah, like, like with friction. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. You can also use some uh, sensation tools, so something cold, something warm, like hot oil, something mm. soft, like feathers. Mm. And so there, there already we are uh, in erotic creativity. Wow. And that, uh, so the senses are our guides towards that. Mm. And it's interesting because from what it sounds like, it's almost like we have to accept that it might feel awkward or strange to talk about these things and that it will take a bit of time before these things, before it takes shape. It seems right like it feels like there's a period where you're really learning about each other's a level of commitment and almost dis discipline to getting to the point where you're you know learning like is it fiery touch that you like or what kind of touch do you like so i think for anybody listening it's important to give that time to exploration right it's true it's true and also in in love making for example everything is mutual and so when we receive something that feels really good we think, mm -hmm. oh, but maybe I should be giving back as well. And so we take ourselves out of our experience in order mm -hmm. to then give back to our partner. And that's the that's how um, uh, taking turns can be can be really effective where we can delve into our own pleasure um, about what feels good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's a powerful one. It's true because it's happened to me before where you feel like, oh, my God, I got to give back now or like, OK, this is too mm -hmm. much time. So when it's regular it's that's beautiful so actually i'd love to dive into the difference between sex and intimacy could you highlight that difference for us mm -hmm. and so intimacy we can also have with ourselves which is about um, honesty and um, so a nice um, way to pronounce intimacy is into me see and um, mm -hmm. so that means like being open being honest and also making ourselves vulnerable Usually when we speak out about our desires, that makes us vulnerable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can tell I can tell you an example from our training. So our training is very hands-on as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we have all experienced what uh, what our clients feel like, and that's very, very, very important. And so I was working with a um, fellow trainee, like a male uh, practitioner to be, and uh, I was, uh, it was receiver led um, uh, touch. And I wanted something that was very difficult to say that I felt vulnerable about. And I thought, okay, well, I need to learn that. So I need to kind of gather up courage and ask him to do that for me. Mm. And I said, would you um, kind of whisper sweet nothings all over my body with like very minimal touch, like light touch? I thought it was very difficult to say. And then he thought about it for a moment and said, no. <laughs> and so, yeah. It is like the moment, yeah. Yeah, and so when we, when we speak out about our desires, first of all, what happens is we realize that we have those desires. We didn't know that before. Sometimes when we hear ourselves speak, we realize what we really like, what we really want. Mm. But there are two dangers. First of all, uh, we have now spoken out and we may get turned down and that's painful. Mm. <laughs> and, and secondly, we may get judged. So especially if it's like in a, a sexuality con context where we share like a, like a role play idea or fantasy and our partner turns around and says, oh, you're perfect. Huh? That hurts. Huh? It does. Yeah. Yeah. So we make ourselves vulnerable, but also the intimacy is exactly that, mm. making ourselves vulnerable. I mean, it's, it's also important to kind of gauge what we can safely share. So I'm not advocating that uh, um, we, we don't take care of ourselves and um, see if our partner would respond positive to that. Uh, so that's mm. also important uh, and uh, to kind of like protect ourselves and protect our hearts. 
um, uh, but um, it, it, so intimacy is, is, is the place where we can evolve from, evolve um, personally on our own mm. personal journey, but also evolve in our, in our relationship and um, uh, uh, come to new levels of the relationship. So this kind of intimacy and honesty with ourselves and with each other are the pathways to that. Wow, that's fascinating. And I guess sex would just, not just, but would come down to the mechanics of what's happening between two people or yourself as well. Is that what you Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say mechanics because there's so much, so much involved. Um, Maybe I don't understand your question. Yet. No, I'm, I'm just curious to see how you would define sex then. Oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, like that's how a would, difficult one. <laughs> yeah, like how would you, yeah, if you, were to, if you were to define it, what would you say it is? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, so um, I don't know if you want to go with Clinton, no? who says that oral sex is no sex. <laughs> and so people have like, have like a different, uh, different perception of like what is sex, huh? Mm. And and so um, often, often when people speak about sex, they speak about uh, intercourse. So if it's like heterosexual sex, it would be like penis and vagina sex. But then what about oral sex? Yeah, is that sex as well? And um, so it depends really who you ask. Huh? Yeah. So it can be like a de- narrow definition of um, uh, being uh, kind of penetrated somewhere in, in an opening with uh, uh, with a penis or with a kind of sexual object uh, or penetrating somebody yeah. else. So that can be a narrow definition of sex. Mm. And if we go back to intimacy for a second, would you say that, because I find, I've personally found sometimes sex to be easier than intimacy, of course, because I could feel aroused for someone and not necessarily intimate with them. So speaking about intimacy, would you say that intimacy is absolutely necessary for us as humans? Because I think a lot of people um, can av- want to avoid this and, you know, push it away. So I'm curious to see, would you say it's like a necessity? For our lives, intimacy mm-hmm. is a necessity for growth. Mm. Uh, I don't think we can grow without being intimate with ourselves. And with the world, really, with the world around us, with our partners. Uh, but yes, we can have sex without without intimacy. Absolutely, we can also be uh, um, naked without intimacy. We can take all our clothes off and have sex and not be intimate. Yeah, mm-hmm. and that's a choice that we yeah. have. Do we want to engage like that? Yeah, we can. No? It's so Maybe true. sometimes it's it's appropriate. So I don't. I'm not judging that at all. And um, so. Um, I think uh, intimacy makes for makes for better sex. It makes for more encompassing sex. Makes for um, sexuality that involves more of us. Huh? So, mm. which makes sex better then? No? Yeah, it's true. It's more. Mm-hmm. It's true, because now we've kind of talked about three different moving pieces, which is communication, intimacy, and then we have the element of trust that gets built as a result. So. What would you say, like, how do these three elements play together to create successful relationships? Wow, that's a big question. Yeah, (laughs) I'm curious because, you know, I I find, well, I find that one of the biggest things today is the avoidance of intimacy because it requires us to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. But trust is such a big thing as well. And our communications, if we don't start to open up about it. So it's kind of like, I want to emphasize why these three pieces are so important in the success of our relationships. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so about trust. First of all, we need to be intimate and trust ourselves. Mm. Uh, sometimes people outsource trust somehow. Mm. And so they expect their partners they expect to trust their partners or they expect the partners to trust them when this kind of intimacy with ourselves is not really there. Mm. And so that's, um, in a way, that's the first step. But we may, like in the, uh, in the interaction with our partners, we may only find out 
that we don't have the trust in ourselves, the intimacy in ourselves. And, and so that's what relationships are for, really. That uh, um, it's, it's in a way, relationships are self-development tools and <laughs> because mm. the kind of like the partners help us to unpack mm. uh, past, past things, past traumas and so on. And uh, also um, the mm. partners help us to find out more about ourselves that we didn't really know. Wow. And, uh, mm -hmm. That's beautiful what you said there. That's really, really powerful. So what, so if this intimacy is so important, intimacy is so important, and a big part of this intimacy is that ability to communicate, what would you say are some of the most common issues for couples around communicating intimacy and sex? Is it vocabulary? Is it they don't know how to express themselves. Like, what would you say is, are the most common issues regarding communicating these things? Mm -hmm. uh, so usually we go uh, with, with sex, with, with partnered sex, we go for what's wor working. And um, so why why uh, go in a, in a mode of exploration if we have found something that's working? And then uh, if mm. we do the same thing of, uh, you know, it's working, but it's not exciting anymore. That that becomes a problem because we you know because eroticism itself is uh, is creativity, and wow. so we need to we need to get creative because else what we don't well we don't um, apply creativity it withers and dies, mm. and that's what but that's where communication comes in because the partner might wonder well, well, why why do you want to try something else yes. <laughs> actually actually my. <laughs> There is, um, there is a kind of uh, prejudice I have that like, in, in, in uh, relationships, there's always like one partner who wants to keep it the same. It's working, <laughs> so why change it? Yeah. And there's, there's the other partner who always pushes the envelope. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's and so, so true. Yeah, and uh, so but, but we need both. We need the kind of like, hmm, you know, <laughs> what? What do you want? <laughs> so we need, in order to, re so this kind of like stability, that's also very important for mm. for couples' lives or family life and so on. And there's also the constant renewal that's, that needs to go on as well. Uh, what, uh, what couples get wrong is um, making love at the end of the day, last thing that doesn't even make it on the agenda and that doesn't make for good sex because the subconscious will override um, our best desire to be present for our partners when, when, we, when we are just tired and want to go to sleep. Mm. So I would look at, first of all, like when, when do you have sex and do you have enough time? Because creativity takes time. Mm. And uh, I would recommend uh, for people to have sex dates and to plan them. Mm. So that the uh, the creativity can be involved more than it would be like with lovemaking at the end of the day. Mm. Yeah, it's so true. Again, one of those taboos where people just kind of leave it to chance and spontaneity, like they want to have spontaneous sex and it's going to be amazing. And I've been, a, I've been, I guess, a victim of that mentality as well myself until I realized that, wow, like if I don't actually prioritize this in my relationship, it's not going to happen. So... Mm -hmm. Powerful. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that tip. Mm -hmm. Thank you so, for sharing that. Yeah, no. And I was wondering because you mentioned a good point there about lacking or feeling like you have no creativity and some people can find that they have no, that they're stuck in this like sex routine. So they always do the same movements, the same positions, the same everything, same time. So what are ways that people can actually enhance their lovemaking skills and infuse ideas into their routine? So actually getting practical, like what are some ways that they can go about in, in and what, what I would suggest is to engage with erotica that can be either individually or together. It doesn't need to be um, mm. online porn, but can be. So to see like, what is actually, what, what turns me on? So what are the specific arousals that I have? And uh, mm. some people are like quite, quite vanilla in their turn on, so they are their partner turns them on. But other people might find um, things that are uh, quite outlandish or like something that they hadn't thought of. Mm. Um, and to engage with different media as well. So it can be like erotic stories, it yeah. can be uh, erotic photography. It can be the Kama Sutra, 
uh, mm. ancient woodcuts and uh, and to to go from there and um, that brings out uh, creative ideas that mm. can then be used um, in carpet love making. Wow. That I've actually never purchased the Kama Sutra, so I definitely will do that. So thank you for that tip. That's beautiful. So it, from from what I've understood and from what we're talking about and also my own research, it just feels like our sex life really comes down to and is distilled to the relationship we most intimately have with ourselves. Like whether we're with a partner or not, it really comes down to that self intimacy, that self knowledge and that self acceptance. So I'm curious to see now talking about like myself as an individual or, or what would you recommend for someone to develop more intimacy with themselves at this point, like to get really comfortable with their own preferences. Like you mentioned the Kama Sutra, but actually like, is there any sexual practices that you'd recommend for people? Uh, it's generally engaging with the senses and uh, all of the senses. Um, so I'm also a mindfulness teacher. And so um, mm. what I like, for example, is for the um, sense of taste. Uh, I don't know if mm. you know the raisin exercise. Mm where you just like eat one raisin in a very specific way and it takes about um, five minutes <laughs> and then so to uh, and it engages other senses as well and so first of all you look you look at the raisin and then you bring it to your ear and you squeeze it a little bit so it has a little slight crunch and um, and only then you take it in your mouth but you don't bite down as yet them and then so that's that's a nice exercise, the raising exercise to engage with the senses. Um, usually, I would uh, recommend um, a love make solo love making sessions, so solo sex, mm. um, maybe uh, and make sh making sure that um, the senses are engaged. So maybe having a bath first of all, um, having nice scents, having maybe something beautiful, beautiful to look at in the space, mm. having different fabrics, interesting fabrics for as sensation tools um, and uh, uh, having beautiful music mm. and so first of all like touching the entire body without being focused too much um, on uh, on arousal even so first of all going going uh, for pleasure and also breath so breath is an important tool in order to feel more mm. and um, so when we feel more it may not all be pleasant and so a lot of people steer clear of uh, breathing deeply into the abdomen because we find all kinds of things stored yeah. <laughs> but also um, we you know we can deepen pleasure via via just like deepening breath mm. Mm, that sounds delicious i love that thank you and mm -hmm. actually you brought up a really good point because i find that even solo sex partnered sex like we're so quick these days and we're so results oriented um, so I would like, cause you just touched upon it, but can you talk to us about the difference between pleasure outside of arousal? Because they, like, I just recently learned this and they're just so, they, they can be so different. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's right. So we can have like physical pleasure. For example, if you think about swimming or being in water, so this kind of like being enveloped, uh, in water, that it, it can potentially be like sensual, which then kind of like be slightly arousing. But first of all, it's just pleasurable. Mm. Yeah. And um, so uh, and also like, for example, like eating something really nice. Huh? And so again, like eating something nice can give us mouth orgasms. Yeah. <laughs> so there, are, there is such a thing or as a as a chocolate chocolate orgasm chocolate orgasm <laughs> or something like that. Huh? <laughs> so that that can happen. But first of all, it's only pleasure. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would invite people to not be too uh, strict about okay, this is this is the platonic pleasure and this is this is arousal. Uh, we can be considerably aroused by just like walking in the rain and feeling the feeling the rain but if we don't have to it can just be like mm -hmm. pleasure by itself and so mm -hmm. in uh what 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 all of that needs to uh, leads to is um uh, is a kind of orgasmic living mm -hmm. because um the, the the world is trying to make love to us wow with, oh. with everything with what we with, with what we see with what uh, um 
And so it's about uh, taking time to see that and feel that via the senses. Wow. I love what you said right there. The world is trying to make love to us. Mm. Mm -hmm. Wow. And with that, because I recently discovered the art of asking for consent. Um, and I, it's something that I had never thought about when I was like doing, being intimate with myself. And so I'm curious to ask you more about the art of asking consent and why that is so important for both partner, but also as, as an individual, like solo sex. Mm -hmm. uh, in uh, relationships, when we are familiar with each other, we are very happy to touch each other. And uh, that can be a little bit over the top because um, when we touch your partner like we would a piece of furniture, that can be very uh, disrespectful. Mm. When we ask for consent for the first time, we realize that our partner may be our partner, but it's not our partner, it's a separate being. Mm. It's a separate uh, person who has the right to their own body. And so we realize, like, when we do when we do start asking for consent, oh, at the moment I'm touching my partner. That's something special. That's something that they can allow or not. That they have a they have a right to say whether they want that or not. Huh? And so it's a it's a kind of sign of respect. Mm. Um, the other thing is about um, uh, mothers or new mothers. Um, I, me myself, I don't have children. Do you have children? Mm -mm. No, and um, so, but I hear that uh, from mothers that um, mm -hmm. children always have a right to their body, especially young children. No, so mm -hmm. they get breastfed, they come, mommy, 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 you know, they kind of <laughs> climb up. Yes, and uh, so this kind of like being constantly invaded by the children, which is lovely, yeah. But then, when the partner then makes advances as well, uh, mm. sometimes sometimes young mothers just want to be not touched. I just want to have like a little bit of time where they just can get their bodies back mm. after after having the children all over them all the time. And, mm. and so that's where then sexual frustration sets in uh, by the partner who really wants, <laughs> wants to mm. have like sex and make love with this beloved partner. Mm. It's so true. And it's, um, wow, I'm so glad you brought that up because I'm sure a lot of women will relate to that, that overwhelm sometimes with being too it's too much and and the, you're right there's a, there's such a beautiful level of respect with asking which also brings up the question of like it is so important to be able to say no right like is yeah. there what yeah i'd love to get your thoughts on like why that is so important <clears throat> when we when we can't say no wholeheartedly then we can never allow ourselves to get close to anybody because it's it's far too dangerous we may do that anyway but it can't be wholeheartedly mm. and um, so because um the kind of being close to someone and uh, trusting someone we need to uh be on the same plane we need to know okay this is in this container but it's um so when we can't say no then it's the, the kind of yes that we say is far too all-encompassing so when we can't say no the yes will be tainted with fear yes mm. wow or we don't allow ourselves to get close in the first place if we can't say no mm. and so in a way the boundaries allow for intimacy with our, with others in order to set to set the container in order to have the feeling that at, uh, on, at every step of the way, we can say no and have a say. Mm. Like we're um, still in control. Still, yeah, we still have our bodies. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. I, you know, it's beautiful. I'd never heard it said like that. And I think it's so powerful for those that are struggling to say no, to commit to a practice of, of learning and communicating that no with, because what you said is so true. Otherwise, we don't really allow our full um, expression and exploration and intimacy with other people. So, mm. and actually, on this topic, I love what you do with vaginal mapping, because 
I didn't know what this was. And, you know, it took me a long time before I discovered everything inside of my, of my genitals because it was just so tucked away. And it was almost, I felt a lot of shame personally. So I'm curious if you can talk to us a little bit more about what you do with vaginal mapping, what is, what is it for? And, and yeah. So the, 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 the vagina, so the, the inside part, is a is a very secret part. So first of all, like for ourselves, for women, it's a, uh, it's a bit difficult to touch, really. So we can mm-hmm. kind of reach around. Um, how and um, often uh, women have a vaginal numbness. So the um, that means that they can't really feel that much inside their vaginas. Huh? So seventy percent of women. Uh, cannot orgasm via penetration alone so they need some kind Mm. of additional stimulation of the clitoris usually and so however um, the vaginas um, also sometimes hold past trauma sometimes past Mm. memories which can be from our own lifetime but strangely also from the lifetime of our ancestors from all women in the world Mm. It's a very mysterious place. And so what we do in a vaginal mapping is we explore the compass points, which is basically the kind of like north and south and east and west. So those, and there's also like points in between, obviously, in, <laughs> in varying depths. Mm. And this is not about getting aroused at all. It's more about being curious what we actually feel there. Mm. Sometimes that uh, can induce mental images, as in like, something dark or like a specific color or something like that um and often when what is felt there when that's expressed verbally the actual tissue changes <laughs> it's, a, it's oh. a very quick it's a very very quick process and it's it's very it's really miraculous what what's happening there as if that part in the woman's body was waiting to be touched and expressed to be heard and to be seen and then that's all that was needed. And then the tissue kind of relaxes somehow. Mm. And so that is that doesn't have to do specifically with arousal, even though it can make the vagina more interesting and mm. more sensitive. And it can also help us explore all the arousal points that are in the vagina as well. Wow. And so if I got this correctly, it's 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 a very in-depth session where I would sit down and then you would help me physically um, identify these points and touch these points and and then get me to if it's available some whatever's coming up for me and expressing it so it's very like hands-on and expressive if I understood correctly yes that's right yeah and wow. uh, again it's receiver led so ideally at each point I would uh, ask you can you feel that so do you need a little bit more pressure do you need maybe like a pulsating touch like that and uh, so it's quite surprising how like just changing a direction or changing the pressure um it it may feel completely different or like what's, what's also very frequent is that one side of the vagina like the left or something like feels very different from the right side of the vagina wow sad yeah <laughs> Wow, it's so true. So many questions. This is so fascinating. Uh Wow. (laughs) Incredible. Well, I'm glad because I think, um, like we said, it's a whole universe down there. So this experience is like a a universe. universe. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So this mapping really helps us to figure out um, and to identify better with our own bodies. And, you know, there's so much that as women, we, we go through our entire life menstruating and like, this is a whole thing for us. And birthing and so sometimes you know we can feel so disconnected when we don't even know or understand our own like the entire thing the vulva the yoni so i can imagine how empowering that must feel after Mm -hmm. Mm. it's about like uh, embracing um, a very secret and uh, sacred Mm. part of us um, um, it's also slightly, slightly trans-inducing, so the G-spot can be a bit trans-inducing. So there's this <laughs> uh, kind of like sudden drop uh, into into like a deeper state, into a deeper relaxation mm. of... Yeah. yeah. 
fascinating. This is incredible. So Stella, I want to get into other juicy details now, and I want to ask them in kind of like a more rapid fire way. Um, mm -hmm. So there'll be probably less engagement between you and I, but I'm just, I had so many topics and I was like, I can't, I need to ask all of these beautiful questions. So um, here we go. Okay. So the first one I wanted to ask you is, you know, kinks and fetishes. So what are the most common kinks and fetishes that clients come to you about that people or just generally that you find people are too ashamed to talk about or bring up? Um, the, 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 the kinks and fetishes people are most ashamed about are the ones that uh, are very, very unusual. And so and then I can't talk about what they are okay. because immediately if, uh, if they would watch this program, they would feel that I'm, I'm so it's client confidentiality. Of course, and I totally uh, it's, understand. Uh, it's 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 very tricky to have like a turn on that uh, and not see see that reflected anywhere, and mm. so partners may be judgmental about it or wouldn't may, may maybe wouldn't want to engage with it, and so feeling very much alone with that turn on mm. and not having heard of anybody else who has the same turn on, that that is um, something that I can help people with mm. to come come to terms with that turn on. Uh, a very common one is a foot fetish especially yeah, for men mm. and um, it's I think it's Emily Nagoski in her book yeah. Come As You Are uh, who um, talks about this homunculus uh, brain map of the uh, sensory brain areas um, where the uh, area for the toes and the feet sits right next to the genital area and so there is an anatomical equivalent and um, also for oh. women some women yeah. orgasm when you poke between the toes <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm going to get, I'm going to go touch my toes after this call. <laughs> See what happens. That's amazing. Wow. And, uh, so uh, like an uh, essential foot massage is uh, can, can open up a lot of things. But then the, the foot fetish. So generally um, fetishes can be very strong uh, turn-ons to the exclusion of everything else. And um, so partners may be very happy when finally um, the partner engages for, like, uh, for yeah. long periods of time with the feet. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> but if it's the only way for the partner to reach... Uh, arousal and orgasm then that may be a problem mm. wow so thank you for sharing that broaden the spectrum a little bit no that's perfect that's perfect mm -hmm. and so there's a lot of mixed emotions around anal and i think particularly for men because you know it's associated with being gay or whatnot and today we're a little more open i would say but still i think a lot of men feel and women as well so i'm curious what are your abcs around anal and how should people approach it? Uh, first of all, um, ask consent mm. and uh, respect the body. So the anal area is uh, it's a very sensitive area and you have like two sphincter muscles. Uh, so uh, first of all, probe with fingers and uh, have plenty of lube. A good idea is to have um, uh, maybe like a nitrile glove or something like that, mm. because a nitrile glove, you can take it off and your hand is clean again yeah. and you can put it elsewhere. <laughs> in the garbage <laughs> yeah. yeah I mean you can put your hand elsewhere <laughs> yeah that's true <laughs> actually yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah and uh, just for just for hygiene reasons mm. and so you need to go and wash your hands and then come back because you can't do as well huh? mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, plenty of lube plenty of lube is important and uh, uh, coconut some swear by coconut oil I mm. like a combination of both and before you put any sex toys in uh, try with your finger and also wait for the anus to swallow your finger rather than mm. kind of pushing something in because it can lead to tears and things like that. If you use mm. sex toys in that area, make sure they have a base mm -hmm. because um, LC, the anus has a tendency of like being able to swallow up uh, whole bananas. Mm. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, then you're, and then you're stuck trying to find it. Yeah, okay. I totally understand. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Wow, fascinating. Thank you for those tips. That's um, Hopefully that'll be helpful for anybody I know it'll be helpful for anybody listening. So um, another thing that I wanted to ask you about was faking orgasms. Um, now I couldn't tell you if that's common or uncommon. I haven't looked up the statistics, but how do we stop doing it if we've been doing it for years? That makes me laugh again because th that depends. Is this about like being like with a partner for 40 years and for 40 years we haven't had a single orgasm with that partner? <laughs> So you're faking it for 40 years. Oh my God, that's a long time. Yeah. <laughs> we, come out, we say, actually, 
<laughs> what am I at all? Do you so want this whole time? One. Yeah. So if if you want to say, tell our partner that we need to maybe need to sit them down and. <laughs> <laughs> so these past forty years, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah that would be a shocker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so generally, um, uh, the kind of um, faking it, so it can also help us to get aroused. Mm. And so there's the kind of like fake it till you make it. Huh? And so we have the kind of like outer expression and then the kind of like inner feeling will follow. But I know that um, a lot of women leave it at that. So it's just the faking and the kind of like uh, sensation never, never really follows. Mm. And so it really depends whether you want that for yourself or whether you are asking like, how do, how do I deal with that in a, in a partner engagement? Huh? Mm. So and if then, you're usually like very loud, very noisy, and then suddenly you're not anymore, your partner will think, oh, she's not, she's not turned on. And so what I usually uh, recommend for um, communication is to ask about scales. And mm. so as women, we, we may want to kind of please our partner and make sounds in order to please our partner, even when we are not so turned on. Eh? Mm -hmm. So sometimes when I see uh, couples engaging with each other in a session, the woman makes like very expressive sounds. And so and then I ask, OK, on an arousal scale, where are you at? Mm, three out of ten. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> and uh, so uh, it's, it's and that's a tool that couples can use to kind of like to just check in. Mm. Where you at, actually? Yeah, so. mm, I love that. I really love that. I think it's so useful. It's true because whether we learned it through porn or something, sometimes we're very expressive people. And yeah, you're right. It doesn't necessarily match up with our arousal level. So it's good to check in. I love that. That's, that's amazing. So, okay. Another one I, I know comes up a lot is losing our libido or the concept of losing our libido. So what can we do? First of all, calm down. Don't worry. And mm. so losing the libido, uh, we need to look at the life circumstances because it's uh, libido is can be heavily influenced by stress, by insecurity, not feeling safe. Mm. Oh, I've just moved in uh, uh, with my husband, but uh, grandmother is sleeping next door and can hear everything we do in bed yeah. or something like that. And so that... <laughs> <laughs> that's a no-no. <laughs> and... Uh, uh, things like that so we would look at uh, at uh, life circumstances also if people are really working hard and uh, there's not much energy left uh, for libido and for sexuality uh, libido changes over life but also there's kind of um, uh, hills and vales and uh, valleys and so it uh, usually it's like something temporary that can come back so even like life circumstances like having having a baby here and so mm. libido might be low after that, or not, yeah. Um, or uh, menopause. Sometimes mm. women have a dip, sometimes not. But I heard people who, who go through menopause and uh, have like a temporary decline in libido, and it comes back stronger than ever. Yeah, <sighs> yeah, Amazing. happens as well. Huh? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so it really depends. So it's. Uh, mm. Mm -hmm. And you're right. I think the stress piece might have a lot to do with it, particularly maybe in our society today. Um, you know, we have a lot going on. So that's first step, though. Calm down. There are waves and valleys. Uh, sorry, uh, hills and valleys in it. So, OK, I would love to know more about porn in the sense. So porn has made it really easy to become aroused uh, is incredibly visual and so it's hard to replicate with a partner and sometimes it doesn't work with our partners so it makes partner dynamic a bit more complicated so what instead of continuing to outsource this pleasure or arousal to porn how can we what would you recommend for us is that about watching porn together with your partner or replicating the same level of arousal that you get via porn? Yeah, so a bit of both, but more what I meant is actually replicating that level that you that what you see in porn and how quickly you can come and reach levels of climax from watching porn versus what it actually takes like in your real relationship. Mm -hmm. um, what uh, Porn is a very sophisticated visual product. And mm -hmm. uh, no, uh, basically, <laughs> so the message is no, no living being can live up to porn. Mm. So you, you won't have that, that same stimulation, particularly if you've been with your partner for, for quite some time. Mm. 
Mm. And so, uh, however, um, because um, the the kind of partner interaction involves more of ourselves, not just the not just on the sexual level, there's mm. also the heart level, and so it will be a very different kind of arousal, and it may not uh, be as high as uh, as as the arousal we have via porn, but it mm. may be more all encompassing. Mm. Okay. And is there something that you'd recommend, particularly for people that would be not, I wouldn't say addicted, like, cause I think when you're addiction, you're probably in a whole other category, but you're very attracted to watching it because it meets that need in a way, which is good. But I just mean like, what's a good way for us to build that back in our relationship? Mm -hmm. So I recommend people to find an intermittent use of porn, first of mm. all. Uh, so to maybe uh, turn porn on and then turn it off and oh. uh, because then we can focus more on the sensations in our body or how it's actually changed changed uh, what our bodies feel like uh, and then to use maybe different media as well so not so much like visual porn but also maybe erotic literature or mm. like photography or erotic art Mm -hmm. I love that. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. And then another one. So what would be the number one thing you would attribute to a woman's ability to orgasm? Uh, often women uh, um, squeeze out orgasms. And so that means like a lot of muscle contraction and holding the breath, uh, which may have its place. Uh, however, when we get like less focused on orgasm and more on pleasure, uh, we can bring more expansion and breath to it and then indirectly it makes for stronger and more fulfilling orgasms mm. Oof. so breath oh. yeah breath also movement generally expansion mm. okay and then the last one is what are some surprising facts about men's sexuality that women should be aware of if you're in a heterosexual relationship of course uh, a lot of men complain that um, uh, women handle their penises quite roughly and um, so women think that all they need to do is this yeah and, and, uh, and sometimes mm -hmm. sometimes they do that without lube and mm -hmm. so that can be the downright uh, brutal or uncomfortable and so what I, my message to women is that penises like sensuality too mm. and also when you touch a penis that you can actually like feel and concentrate on what you what what, what the sensation is in your fingers when you explore and that can feel quite nice for a man when when his uh, when his uh, genitals are actually like explored and there's pleasure to be had just via touching and via finding things uh, in that area and then generally loop so either um, water-based loop or saliva if that's not available so saliva might be better if you later on want to give um, oral sex mm -hmm. then uh, you, you know loop may may have may have a taste that that you don't like so mm. that's something to be kept in mind <laughs> <laughs> oh my god this is so good thank you so much for all these incredible tips and for touching on all of these little nuggets for us so are there any books or podcasts or resources that you'd recommend i know you offer courses um as well so outside of the incredible amount of resources that you have on your website which i'll lead everybody to are there any books or podcasts or any content out that you'd recommend Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, yes, um, there are books about female anatomy and also books about male anatomy that are quite encompassing, so that I like. Um, uh, Emily Nagoski is a good one, Come As You mm. Are. Um, and uh, uh, on, um, uh, on Instagram, there are actually quite a lot of um, uh, people who um, have uh, vagina images. Mm -hmm. And so I would I would recommend those and and so uh, like this beautiful drawings of vaginas and uh, vulvas as well and and so um, I really like those uh, so there's quite a lot all out there even on Instagram. Mm, amazing, that's mm -hmm. awesome. I, I I've actually read that book by Emily and it's really good. So I would highly recommend uh -huh. everybody pick up a uh -huh. copy. That's beautiful. So, mm -hmm. um, what is one thing you would encourage women to do for themselves? Uh, engage more with your senses and uh, also relax mm. because uh, we can only feel when we allow ourselves to relax else we are constantly in an adrenaline response and when we are running from the saber-toothed tiger we can't feel 
So, mm. <laughs> because it's a biological function, so we can only really feel when we relax. And via relaxation, we find our own pace. Mm. And unless we find our own pace, it will always be a struggle. So please, let's stop struggling. Mm. Oof. Tapping that in. That's beautiful. Thank you for those words. Um, wow. And before we conclude, what is the best piece of advice that you've ever been given that you would also give? It's about uh, listening. So that's listening not, all, not only to ourselves, but also to our partners. Uh, because understanding somebody else um, r- requires that in a way we let go of all our own belief systems. Mm. Uh, because it's usually like we, we think we know how people work and yes. <laughs> At least, because yeah, we go exactly. by ourselves. Yeah? <laughs> so we go by our own preferences. Eh? And so when we like to be kind of like stroked so beautifully on the face, why does our partner not like that? That's really mm. beautiful. I can feel it's really beautiful. But they might need somebody, something else, something, you know, something stronger or so. And mm. in order to really let that in, we need to be able to listen. Usually mm. when we listen, we uh, prepare a response in ourselves. Mm. And that prevents us from listening. And mm. so what I, usually, what I usually recommend couples is to maybe set a timer kind of like set aside a practice and set a timer um, where they just listen maybe for two minutes or three minutes to just let the partner talk and to use the breath to really breathe that into their hearts. Mm. Um, And that does away with this kind of punishing attitude that we sometimes have when we are young towards ourselves and also towards our partners. So we punish ourselves in the gym, and we punish our partners somehow like directly or indirectly for something that we think they should do, mm. but that they didn't do because they are other people or they didn't quite understand that. When we really listen and develop empathy for them from where they come from, which is a different place than, uh, than we would gauge them. Wow. Mm-hmm. Mm, I love that listening piece as well. Mm. Oh my gosh, Stella, we've covered so much ground today. This has been such an incredible episode. Thank you so much. You're a remarkable woman. I love the work that you're doing. You're changing so many people's lives and opening them up and allowing them some real self-acceptance and more pleasure and sensuality in their life. And I think that's so, so beautiful. And I wanted to ask you just before I close, if there's anything that you'd like to share before we, we end. Uh, well, so it's maybe about um, this current situation about um, a COVID-19 mm. and um, which affects the entire world. And uh, so just a message to please be gentle, be, be mm. gentle with yourselves. Um, the, the, the kind of work routines may not work the same way as they used to because we need to process so many things, so mm. many changes and uh, to really take it slowly and also to be super patient with our partners and with our children. Mm. Everybody is processing. And um, so like also like be kind in emails, be kind and patient with, uh, uh, with your friends wow. uh, so that we can go through this in, in a loving and kind way as much as we can. Yeah, of course. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mm. thank you so much Stella it's been incredible thank you thank you thank you (laughs) thank you thank you for having me Yvonne and asking me all these questions it was really interesting and I enjoyed that oh amazing me too I really really did so thank you